Good afternoon. My name is Warren Wood. I'm the Darcy Lecture Coordinator, and I'd like you to welcome you to the Darcy Lecture. Each year, the National Groundwater Association supports travel for a distinguished, internationally recognized scholar to lecture at universities and research uh, institutions throughout the world. This year's lecture is Dr. David Heinemann. Dave is an associate professor in the Department of Geological Sciences at Michigan State University, where he's been on the faculty since 1995. He is an associate editor of Groundwater and also Water Resources Research and a Lilly Fellow. Dave received his bachelor's degree from the University of Arizona and his PhD in Geological and Environmental Sciences from Stanford University. Dave embodies the spirit of Darcy by combining theory with applied research in groundwater and is the author of numerous publications dealing with the use of seismic data to define hydraulic conductivity and bioremediation. His presentation today, Efficient Large-Scale Bioremediation of a Heterogeneous Aquifer, the Schoolcraft Bioaugmentation Experiment, is a direct result of this research. David? Thank you very much, Juan. It's a great pleasure to be here today, and I'd like to begin by thanking National Groundwater Association for the honor to give these presentations around the world this year. The research I'm presenting today is Efficient Large-Scale Bioremediation in a Heterogeneous Aquifer, the Schoolcraft Bioaugmentation Experiment. And I need to say up front that this research has been a collaboration of many different people amongst a variety of disciplines. We've brought together people from microbiology, civil engineers, hydrogeologists, all to solve a real world problem. Can we actually create a efficient bioremediation system in the field, study that and understand the rates and processes that are occurring at the site? And that's the story I'll tell you today. I need to give special thanks to several people that were critical to this project, and I'm hoping that most of the people are here today. Mike Dibus is our project manager, and if he's here, if he could stand up. I actually don't see him. And M.S. Penny Kumar has been the postdoc on modeling. He's up front. He's at the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Michigan State. And Craig Criddle, also up front, is at Stanford University. And he was formerly faculty at Michigan State when much of this work was occurring. I also need to thank Michigan Department of Environmental Quality for funding the research. And I need to thank my wife, Teresa Heinemann, who's also in the second row. She can stand up. And I need to thank her because this is the 58th lecture, so she's been pretty patient with me this year. This is the large list of contributors. And as you can see, these multidisciplinary efforts end up having a lot of people that contribute significant efforts. On the left are all the students, faculty, and postdocs that were involved at Michigan State University. Three consulting companies in the top center, a couple of people from Germany, Oak Ridge National Lab, and Craig Criddle's current group at Stanford University. Some of the scientific and engineering challenges that we have faced and continue to address in this research is first of all, site characterization. How much is enough? We constantly, when we look at these contaminant remediation problems, we have to understand how the subsurface is arranged. Where do we have high hydraulic conductivity paths and where do we have low hydraulic conductivity paths? And how do we do that? Is continuous coring the best approach or are some novel approaches with geophysics a potential future solution. The second point here that transport model predictions are rarely accurate is something that if you look through the literature, you commonly find that transport models are most commonly used in a retrospective sense. We look back and try to understand what has happened in a particular setting. We alter and adjust parameters to describe that setting, and that's a very useful way to look at models. In this study, we're trying to take models one step forward. We're trying to use them in a truly predictive sense, where we can use the models to design a remediation system and then to test the system and understand the rates and processes. When we talk about designing a remediation system, one of the first things we see is that traditional approaches tend to be pretty inadequate. Pump and treat remediation has not been very effective at cleaning up many contaminant plumes. So we need to do something new. One novel approach is bioremediation. 
However, if you're going to use microbes, we find that microbially induced processes are quite complex. One way to address this is you can do a whole series of experiments in the lab and try to understand what's happening, but it turns out that they're very different often between the lab and field. The Schoolcraft site in Michigan is located right here in southwestern Michigan, and we have a carbon tetrachloride plume that is over a kilometer long, about 100 meters across, and goes from about 8 to 26 meters below ground surface. In addition, we have nitrate at fairly significant levels, 50 to 80 parts per million. If you see this plume, one of the big questions, if we go back to that, is what happened as far as a source? And right here, we have the source, which turns out to be grain silos. And we don't want to show that one, apparently. <laughs> the grain silos, it turns out, carbon tetrachloride was actually put on those to kill rats, and the rats, of course, did perish. We don't want to think about the fact that carbon tetrachloride is a significant groundwater contaminant and also sorbs to grain. Some of the work that Craig Criddle and others, including Mike Divis, have done a lot of work on is carbon tet biodegradation in the lab. And this is the microbe, Pseudomonas stutzeri KC. It's an excellent iron scavenger. It outcompetes indigenous microbes by emitting this compound, PDTC. What we do is we create iron limiting conditions by raising the pH to greater than 8. Let me go ahead and just to do something here, since clearly this computer, uh, well, we're going to go back. This is the th reason you don't use somebody else's computer in a talk. <laughs> okay. So the microbe, under these conditions, emits a chelating agent. This chelating agent is basically allowing the microbe to get these trace metals that it needs. The microbe is not actually degrading carbon tetrachloride. The PDTC itself is degrading carbon tetrachloride. So when you combine this with carbon tet, you get complete degradation all the way down to carbon dioxide and non-volatile products. And that's very important because if we get partial degradation, that is not an efficient process. Designing the bioremediation system involves a series of models coupled with optimization codes. Here's a map view of the model showing flow coming in from the left-hand side, coming out on the right-hand side. The idea is to create a continuous bio-curtain through a vertical transect through the plume. So a 15-meter wide zone. The number one question is how many wells do we put in the ground? Do we put 15 wells in with alternating injection and extraction? all the way across here to deliver microbes and nutrients across this transect. The alternative, perhaps, would be just three wells. In this case, maybe you inject into the two end wells, extract from the center. In all of these scenarios, all we're doing is recirculating water and adding substrate for the microbes. In the cost optimization framework, we look at what the best way to pump under a variety of well scenarios. For seven wells, we inject into these four wells here, where you see high concentrations in this map view. We extract from the areas in between, so these three points right here. Again, we're recirculating flow through there. The question is, as we increase the number of wells from seven to 13, do we actually achieve a more efficient solution? And it turns out that this is more efficient because by pumping in at more locations, you can get a better delivery of those nutrients along that central injection point. The optimal scenario that we found is actually 15 wells with a flow reversal. So in this case, we're not just pumping into these wells here. What we do is we'll take water out of the wells we've just injected and we'll put it into these former extraction points. We want to fill these gaps in concentration and get as even a concentration distribution across the site as possible. Since the state is funding this research, one of the most important questions is how does this actually play out in terms of cost? Clearly, it's more expensive to put 15 wells in the ground, 
But it turns out that 15 wells is the least cost scenario. This includes the total cost of installation plus long-term operation for about 25 years. That's this axis here relative to pumping rate. Seven wells is very expensive. As you go down to the bottom, 15 wells ends up being optimal. As I mentioned, aquifer characterization is a critical aspect to understanding these systems and a necessary step to have flow models that are accurate. What we did at this site was we collected continuous cores from seven different points across the site. We have a series of slug tests, tracer tests, and then a more novel technology, cross-borehole radar tomography. Can we actually image the subsurface properties? Here's a map of the site and a general framework showing contaminated water flowing in from the left-hand side, flowing through our reactive curtain, coming through, hopefully, as remediated or cleaned up water. We have a whole series of multi-level observation wells, a series of them upgradient to show what's flowing into our system, and then a whole series of these downgradient to also show what's coming out of the system. A photo also on the top. So here we have the upgradient, the delivery well gal gallery buried below ground, and then downgradient wells. Here's a geologic classification of the core material from the site. And this was the first step of characterization. We wanted to have a rapid characterization. So we just classified them into five different size classes across this depth profile, across the delivery well gallery. And the first thing we note is that in the deep sediments here, we have what would be high hydraulic conductivity, coarse and very coarse sands. There's also a high conductivity sediment area here major low conductivity regions near the top, and then an important small lens right in here that will be very important in this discussion. Right below this, at 27.5 meters, we have a continuous clay across the site. That's the bottom of the aquifer. Our next step was to update our models. We needed three-dimensional flow and transport models to characterize flow through the site. We didn't have time to do hundreds of hydraulic conductivity samples in the time frame we were looking at. Instead, we used this visual classification to separate out different layers of sediment. We end up with a four-layer hydraulic conductivity model that we'll use to update our flow and transport predictions. Here's what we come up with as a first prediction of what's going to happen in the site. Bromide concentration on the vertical axis, pumping time on the horizontal axis. The design scenario we wanted was to get 25% breakthrough after five hours. The model showed that 40 gallons per minute total across the system would achieve that with this breakthrough curve. So we injected 16 parts per million, four parts per million is 25%. Now the question is, if we go operate this just as the model had shown in the field, what do we actually obtain? You'll see a whole series of measurements here on top of the model. All the different colors represent different extraction wells. So we're sampling those through time. You'll see there's quite a wide spread around this tracer prediction. And the question is, why does that actually exist? Well, it turns out the site is actually quite heterogeneous. And that heterogeneity is really not accounted for in this model. The model would say that the extracted concentration from most of these wells would be essentially identical because there's no lateral heterogeneity in the model. With a layered hydraulic conductivity model, we'd expect them all to come through about here. So the heterogeneity is causing this additional range of spreading. But the goal, again, was really just to describe the average behavior. If we average the measurements, we get these yellow boxes here. And given that this was a true prediction, we did this before the tracer ever went in the ground, we were pretty happy with the model actually showed. This wasn't just an academic exercise. The question came to if these did not come as close as this did, we would actually have to change our system operation because the model-based design was very important. Since these came right on top of each other, we kept the system operation pumping 40 gallons a minute for five hours one hour of recirculation. We did that for roughly four years. As I mentioned, we've been doing some novel approaches to characterization. This is cross-borehole ground-penetrating radar. Each of these is a vertical plane 
through the subsurface. This is electromagnetic wave velocity. D1 and D15 are wells at the end of the delivery well gallery. So we're imaging electromagnetic wave velocity using tomography. And one thing you might wonder is, does this have any correlation to subsurface properties? We'd love it if we could just convert this into hydraulic conductivity. Well, it turns out that's not possible with this. What we think we're really imaging here is a better idea of subsurface porosity, which most commonly in hydrogeologic models is estimated to be 30% or something like that. If we can actually obtain high resolution estimates of porosity, this should help us in our flow and transport predictions. Once we had our system up and operating, we did have the luxury of having 220 hydraulic conductivity samples run across this area here. And you can barely see the color bar here, but it's one and a half orders of magnitude conductivity. So it's not highly heterogeneous, it's mildly heterogeneous, but a very similar range as to what we had actually seen earlier. You see high conductivity sediments at the bottom and in an area here, low conductivity at the top, and in a lens right through here. Will this actually be enough to estimate and predict the tracer transport? We'll go through in a minute. We also want to see what can we obtain from cores that we can't get from things like geophysics. We can get an idea of the contaminant concentrations. Here we have carbon tetrachloride concentrations on the solids from zero to 45 micrograms per kilogram. And we see high concentrations in the deep high conductivity sediments. This makes sense because we've put this system down near the leading edge of our plume, and at that point, you should always have your higher concentrations in high conductivity sediments because that's where water is moving down gradient most rapidly. On the right, I'm showing sorption coefficient estimates, and you'll see something that at least initially was puzzling to us high sorption coefficients in our highest conductivity sediments. This would be exactly opposite of what most people would guess. But it turns out, if you look at these sediments in detail, this is a glacial outwash deposit. The glacier that deposited these happened to erode a coal deposit and distribute fine coal particles through this area. So it's very important to look at these site-specific aspects before you actually determine what's happening with sorption. Something I've been doing recently with Gary Weissman in our department and Susie Beitman, a grad student, is lithologic characterization. Can we directly incorporate geology into the characterization process? On the left, I'm showing hydraulic conductivity that's obtained from Krieging, a geostatistical method to interpolate those 220 samples. Very similar to what I showed you earlier, this is just a 3D representation. The 2D goes through a plane starting at these black lines here, down through the field. On the right, I'm showing what happens if you just look at the cores in detail and break out different lithostratigraphic zones, areas where there's a break in lithology type, we find there are three major ones shown with these red arrows. And what we do then is within each zone, so for example, this top zone, we'll still use geostatistics, but we'll use it independently for each of these four zones. The main visual difference you'll see is the area of this blue low conductivity zone. But the question is, does this actually make a difference in terms of flow and transport prediction? So for each of those fields, I simulate tracer transport in three dimensions. This is depth, down gradient distance, and distance across the delivery gallery. Simulate the injection of a six hour pulse of tracer across the injection zone. Let it move down gradient by natural gradient flow for about 25 days. And you'll see it moves most rapidly in the two high conductivity sediment areas as expected. It's slow in the two low conductivity areas. Well, it turns out to make a pretty big difference in terms of tracer transport. Here I'm showing a fairly complicated picture. If you look on the right, this is depth. So increasing depth downward. These are a series of wells that are about a meter and a half down gradient of the delivery well system. On each plot, I have normalized concentration from zero to one. The data are shown with X's and there's two models on top of those. The first case I'll show you will be a no zonation case. Typical geostatistical situation. 
And if you look, you'll see just in comparison, lithologic zonation in red significantly improves many of these points, especially at this depth here, 19.8. You'll see how many of these come through more accurately just by incorporating lithologic zonation. A very simple thing to do if you have a geologist to actually look through this core material. Let me now step back from the modeling and show you what actually happened at the site. Were we able to successfully remediate things? And how did other constituents change through time? I'll show you vertical down gradient transects, mostly on transect A. When it comes to carbon tetrachloride, I'll show you transect A and transect B. This is the measured pH adjustment at the site. And each of these is a depth profile. The left-hand side is up gradient. The right-hand side is down gradient. So on day 25, you'll see fairly homogeneous pH right around 7.5. After we've been putting in pH 8 water for somewhere in the range of 90 days, you'll see higher pH water is starting to come through on the up gradient side of these profiles. We're now getting in the pH 8 range. This is exactly what we wanted to see before we put microbes into the subsurface. We inoculate on day 117. We continue to alter the pH. So through time, you see the entire region come up into this high pH range, which creates this niche for the microbes. The nitrate concentrations are a bit more interesting because they start out in heterogeneous state, ranging anywhere between about 25 and 50 parts per million as a background. You start to see those concentrations come up to an average of 50 parts per million. All we're doing during this time frame is mixing. We're not adding any nitrate at all. It turns out we have continuous screens as our delivery well system. So we're pulling in the most water from high conductivity zones. Those zones have some of the highest nitrate concentrations. So the average extracted nitrate concentration is 50 parts per million. We re-inject that into the subsurface until we get to day 116. The nice thing about starting out on this day is that we have a fairly homogeneous distribution of nitrate. It's almost like a laboratory condition in the field, such that when we inoculate a day later with microbes, all of these changes are due to the inoculation with microbes and also addition of acetate. You'll see the microbes use essentially all of the nitrate. They're taking it right down very close to zero. You see it first in the high conductivity zone. It then propagates down through the system and is even cleaned up in the low conductivity zones. It turns out that we were putting in a bit too much acetate, 100 milligrams per liter. As a result, we were actually initiating sulfate reduction. If any acetate is left when the nitrate is removed, that means there's acetate left for the next level of microbes, which are sulfate reducers. We knew that was true because we started to smell that wonderful rotten egg smell and get the wells coated with a little black slime. So we cut it back from 100 milligrams per liter to 50 milligrams per liter, and we resolved that situation. This nitrate concentration is still below EPA's standards. The most important story of all, carbon tetrachloride remediation. Can we really clean it up? Two transects, A and B. The starting point you'll see is quite heterogeneous. By day 97 to 99, what we're doing during this phase is just mixing and recirculating water again. We're not adding carbon tetrachloride. The reason it looks like that is, again, our high conductivity zones have some of our highest concentration. The average extracted concentration is 30 parts per billion. We inoculate on day 117, and you'll see the concentration starts to be reduced and remediated on the up gradient end through time. This propagates down gradient through the system, and the system is looking fairly clean. Well, our measures of success were twofold. One, we wanted to bring carbon tetrachloride below five parts per billion. That's EPA's standards. The second is, we told the state we'd like to see 60 to 75% degradation. Well, it turned out we did a little bit better than that. This is a histogram of what we saw at the site, and you can see we get nearly complete remediation. The percent aqueous phase carbon tetrachloride degraded is mostly near 100%, and average about 97%. So the state was pretty happy with that. 
In addition, the sorbed phase carbon tetrachloride is also being remediated. I'm showing the screened interval across this depth profile here. On the top, you'll see log carbon tet concentration on cores that were taken about a meter down gradient of the system. Before we did anything, we have this line on the right, which is a light blue, fairly uniform concentrations from two to 20 micrograms per kilogram. After about seven months, we have this red line. It's about 65% degradation in the solid phase. After about two and a half years, we have about 92% degradation with this line on the left. Many of these are actually near the detection limit of the instrument, but there is still some contamination down near the deep portion of the aquifer. Well, it turns out if we go two and a half meters down gradient, we find it's nearly complete degradation all the way down. We believe this is a transient phase of solutes coming into this region. In addition, we have some chloroform production. I mentioned we were stimulating sulfate reducers for a period of time, and they were producing some chloroform. So at the beginning, there's no chloroform. We start to see some, but we reduced our acetate feed right around here, and you can see the chloroform went away. So despite intensive study ahead of time, some of these things come up in the field that you have to be willing to adapt to and understand as the system progresses. This is the only microbiologic slide I'll show, and the only point is what's happening with microbes at the site. This is a strain-specific DNA probe, and we're trying to see a strong signal that our microbes are present at wells. We would accept a weak signal. The time is on the left-hand axis increasing downward from day 117, the inoculation day. What we wanted to see early on was bright red all the way across here. We didn't see that. We saw it only at a few wells, and we were a bit concerned about this because this meant our initial delivery of the microorganism was not what we had hoped it would be. Well, it turned out we knew right when we put the microbes in the ground there was a problem. Our strain became flocculent because we used filter sterilization to remove any other microbes, and during that process we removed trace metals critical to these microbes. We weren't aware of it at the time. We had a crisis meeting on site, decided to go ahead and inoculate, and then see if this didn't work, we could always re-inoculate later. Somewhere in the time frame of about day 190, we made the decision we were going to re-inoculate. We wish we'd waited about a week or so because we started to see microbes coming through. We re-inoculate on day 200, only re-inoculating the right-hand side. Eventually, you'll see microbes coming through all but one of these wells. So eventually, we were able to actually overcome this as well in the field. The last phase of the work was reactive transport modeling. Can we develop complex multi-component reactive transport models and understand the rates and processes of reactions at the site? This work was Mike Witt's dissertation work in 1999 and some follow-up work in some modeling, which has been published recently. In Mike Witt's dissertation, he has a two meter long column it's packed with schoolcraft sediment. You take schoolcraft groundwater and add the contaminant to that, push it through the column at a rate that's similar to groundwater flow at the field site. You then create a slug injection zone here where you inoculate with microbes once. You then feed those microbes once a week. So effectively an analog to what we'll be putting in the field. I'll show you modeling and measured results for this. Start at the top, we have acetate at six days. This is a profile that starts with the inlet on the left-hand side, the outlet on the right-hand side. The microbes at time zero were put in right here in the slug injection zone. After six days, that slug is moved down to this point. Carbon tetrachloride at the same point in time, six days, it started out as all 0.1 parts per million. You'll see just after the inoculation,